Welcome back. Uh, we're in the procedural generation track. Um, Noor is the chair, so I'm uh, going to introduce her again. She's uh, in charge of the PCG, or one of the primary authors of the PCG book, and she's got a lot of experience uh, uh, and a good overview of lots of different uh, PCG techniques, and she's going to share that with us today. So take it away. Thank you very much. So in today's talk, I'm going to go, go along with the book, which has like right now, well, first, I'm a postdoc researcher at IT University of Copenhagen. I'll be soon moving to Aalborg University as an assistant prof, still in Copenhagen. Uh, but yeah, I'm doing mainly research on procedural content generation and player modeling and game adaptation. So I'm on that area of games. And recently, well, not recent, very recently, two years ago, we started writing a book about procedural content generation game. Is this working? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Uh, so uh, the book, well, mainly was to be used in, in the course that we were teaching at ITU and still being used for that purpose. And it right now has 12 different chapters covering more or less the main topics in, in BCG. It has many, many different examples and wh where, each, where each technique can be used and how. The book can, is, is freely available and you can access the individual chapters online by going to bcg.com, bcgbook.com. You can download the chapters and you can use them for your own research, for the courses you are organizing, and so on and so forth. So in, in today's talk, I'm going to give some examples from academia, because this is more or less a conference in between academia and research, and you have heard, heard a lot about examples in, in the game industry. So I thought I'm going to give some examples, mainly from, from a research area. Uh, and I'm going to go through the main topics covered in the book that we usually use to procedure to automatic for automatic generation of content. And this will include the search pairs paradigm, constructive paradigm, and recent, very recent paradigm that we, that is basically a combination between search pairs and constructive, which we call progressive approaches. I'm going to, well, in these three, three different methods, I'll talk about generating content that you usually see in the game, so that the, the physical artifact that you usually visualize in the game. And that's why I have a different section for generating game rules or game mechanics. I'm going to also touch on mixed initiative BCGs, which are tools that are mainly built with, with BCG methods to assist game designers, to give them feedback about design, to give them hints, to boost creativity, and so on. Uh, I'm going to talk also a little bit about experience driven processor and content generation, which is a combination between modeling players, so how can we detect player behavior while he's playing the game and then use this information to generate content that is tailored to specific playing style or player behavior. And I'll finally talk a little bit about evaluation. So how can, if we build content generator, a content generator or a multiple content generators for the same game, how can we evaluate the content that this, this generator is, is creating? So the first example I would like to introduce is, is a very, um, very popular game in, in the academic area, which is called Galactic's Arm Race. This game was started as a research project, and it's now uh, commercially available for people to buy and play. This is a space shooter game, and it's, uh, it started as a research because it has BCG in it, in, in the sense that it detects player behavior and it generates different types of weapons according to his behavior. So if you play the game for a while, you get to choose specific weapons from a set of, of initially randomly generated weapons. And as you go with the game, and depending on, you, on, how, on what, what weapon you are choosing and how long you choose to play in each, in each weapon, the, the game will evolve new types of weapons depending on, on your preferences. So you get to explore more novel sort of weapons and they are all personalized according to your behavior. And you can see here some weird looking nice examples about some weapons evolved for particular, uh, for particular players who played the game. The other example I'd like to show is, is a game we recently created called uh, Crowdbeam. So this was presented in FDG conference last month. And this is mainly motivated or inspired by how Minecraft and Terraria work, if you, uh, Terraria game works, if you are familiar with these two games. And it's built completely using PCG, PCG methods. It, and the methods we, we are using for this game are relatively simple. And I just wanted to show that using some, sometimes simple method works and it gives interesting and, and, nice, and nice results. Yeah, it's a bit, bit tricky to get this right. 
So the whole content of this game was, was built using automatic content generation methods, and I'm going to talk about some of the, of the methods used in this game in, in, in my talk. So these are different things that you can use with, that you can do with this game. You can build and you can deconstruct and deconstruct things. It can be used for different purposes, and as you can as you'll see in a while. I'm just going to speed this a while. So you can use it for uh, infinite runner, for infinite racing car games, for Spelunky-like games, and as you'll see in a while. He will fail it. So this game is open source. The, the source for generating the main part of the game is publicly, publicly available on, on GitHub. This is another type of game that you can build using, using this uh, basic source code. This is more or less like Spelunky, I would say. Dungeons and fires, not enemies yet. All right, so let's move on. And I missed the sound, sorry. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about the method that we are using, usually using for generating these types of, of games, and I'll start with the search-based, um, okay, with a search-based approach because it's, well, this is the most widely used approach, and there are many different variations of it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the basics. So this is more or less a special case of generate of, and, of generate and test. You generate a population of a number of, of individuals. And then you you pick the ones that are that are more feasible or that are better for your specific problem, and then you breed those. You you do the evaluation. You get a new generation. You do evaluation again. You breed the, the best ones, and and you go on with. It. So this is an evolutionary based method. And in in order to do this sort of method, you need a way to represent the content. So if you are generating maps for StarCraft, you need a way to to encode your, your maps so that the method can understand what you are try trying to build or what you are trying to create. And you need, you need a way to evaluate those. So I'm gonna talk first about content representation. And there are, there are many different methods for, for how to represent the content. And the basic, and they, they kind of range in between di very direct and very indirect methods. And the basic direct method is simply a direct representation of the content. So if I'm going to talk about examples on Super Mario Bros because there has been lots of work done in this area. So I'm going to give a number of examples for different representation for this uh, specific game. So let's say that you have a level for Super Mario Bros and you want to represent it. Then the, the simplest way of thinking about that is to represent the level which is a 2D level as a 2D matrix, which basically you take each cell and you encode it with a unique number that represent basically what is in that cell. This is very direct representation, but it's not very efficient because then your method will find very hard time searching for content or making content that looks uh, that looks good or that's playable. Because there are many different variations that you can do in order to reach a feasible solution. So we usually don't do that. We go into more indirect representation, uh, one of which is the use of grammar. Grammar is an easy way to, to represent content. You can simply convert convert to whatever you are generating in, into readable grammars. And they are nice because you don't have to be an expert or a technical expert to understand what the grammar is saying. So for instance, this is a grammar for how Super Mario Bros might look like. And it basically says it might look a bit scary, but if you really read it, then you, you'll, you'll figure out that it's not that, that hard. It basically says that the level is a list of chunks, which is the sub part of the level, followed by enemies place, placement place, placed above these chunks or above the, the main ground that you are building. And the chunk can be one of the main elements of Mario, so it can be a gap, it can be a platform, it can be coins, blocks, and so on and so forth. And each of these has, has an X, X, X and Y position, so where it is placed in the map. It has uh, some 
characteristic or some uh, chunk specific properties such as the width of the gap, the, the height of the platform and so on. So this, this is pretty easy and it's very much understandable by, by non-technical people and that's why we, we like to use grammars as, as a way of representation. And another, another important factor here is that grammars are, can, be, can be easily evolved. So there is a specific uh, type of search pairs or, or of uh, evolutionary algorithm that deals with, with grammar so that you can evolve solutions that, that is driven fr from this grammar, which makes them very suitable for search-based approaches. And here are some examples of level evolved using the grammar that you used before. So this exact grammar that you have, that you have seen here results in a very variety of uh, levels that some, th some of them looks like human-like, such as maybe the third one. The other one looked pretty much different, but they might be also interesting from, for, for specific players. So you get to explore a wider range of content. You can pick from those and you can evolve them further. Another way of representing content is by extracting patterns. And this is more advanced, I would say. And patterns can be, in, can be extracted from, well, if you need to extract patterns, then you, you will have to have an initial set of levels. So in, for example, in, in the Super Mario Bros case, you can have the levels generated by the humans in the first place. You can analyze them. You can, as a human, extract patterns. So you can say that in the level generated by the, by the initial creator of Super Mario, they put these types of content after each other and so on. So you can extract a number of patterns that happens frequently in those levels. There are more advanced techniques that allows machine learning methods, basically, to, to, extract, to automatically extract patterns from levels that have been created already. Uh, one of these techniques called non-negative matrix factorization, which basically, in, in, in this case, you represent a set of levels as strings of numbers, indicating what exactly is happening throughout the levels. And then you do some sort of mathematical formulation. So you extract basically two matrices, one of which uh, represent the patterns that occurs in, in, in your input space or in your input levels. And the other one has the weights that has been applied to those, to those patterns. So you can, for each pattern extracted, you can get different variation of it by changing the weight. And by the way, if you have questions, just feel free to, to, to ask me while I'm presenting. It's, it's easier, easier for me and for you to follow this way, I think. So these are some example patterns extracted using this method from Super Mario Bros. You can see changes in, in, the, in the platform height, number of coins and blocks, enemies uh, traversing on his own, and then a group of enemies. And these are very weird looking, some weird looking levels generated using this method. And the, the nice thing about this method it, is that it can be easily parameterized so that you can get levels that looks like the original, or you can tell, tell the method to, to explore the space so that it can generate this weird looking uh, new, new kind of levels. I particularly like the last one because it has many coins and enemies and stuff. <laughs> Uh, so here's the tool that we built for, for using pattern extraction using non-negative matrix factorization. And this was presented in AID last year. And we call the method PATOX, which is patterns extracting, extracted from a uh, DOX game. And it was originally Super Mario, but we just changed the graphics because of Nintendo copyright issues. We were not allowed to use the, the graphics anymore. So you can train the, train the method uh, you can ask the method to be trained on, on a new level so that it can extract a new matrices for patterns and weights. You can activate some of the patterns that has been extracted. So the interface project what has been extracted into this interface. Um, you can activate or deactivate patterns, change the weights so that you get variation for each pattern. At, 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 each, at any point in, uh, in the process, you can play the, the level, you can go back to the interface, you can deactivate and activate some, some others, you can add patterns for coins, for enemies, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can also activate some of the patterns and then ask the middle to automatically generate the rest of the level so that it varied the one that you have not selected previously and generate a set of levels such as the one here. You can pick any of those and continue working on them.
right. That's my husband playing. He's not a very good player. <laughs> and I think he's hearing that right now. So, yeah. So the other, the other matter that you should take care of when, when generating content using search-based approach is evaluation method. So, and this is especially important for search-based method because you're generating a, a wide range of content and you need a way to know which one is good or which one is better than others, you know. For, for in order for the method to continue evolving those. And there's also a wide range of, uh, of evaluation functions that, that you can use for this purpose, one of which is a direct evaluation function. And in this case, you simply extract features from your, uh, from your, from your individuals. You weight them according to, the, to how do you think they are important. And then you, you, give, you give a rank or you give a score for each individual based on that. So, for example, in StarCraft, if you are generating maps for StarCraft, and let's say that you have these two examples here, you have the map on, the, on my right, uh, the, dark, the dark green represent levels, h higher levels, and the light greens represent levels that are lower, and in this case we have three height, and if you look at this map, you can somehow tell that the one on the right, on my right, is, is better than the one on the left. And this is mainly because you have a wider area for where to place the bases, which is, in this case, these large green areas. So if you place a base there, then it will be surrounded by quite a large area for you to expand. It has a more, uh, less choke points and it has more paths that between, between the bases. So if you could extract this information from your from your representation, then you could easily give a score that gives the one on the right a higher score than the one on the left. And then the method will know that this one is better and it will be more presented in, in the later populations. The other way of evaluating content is, is uh, through a simulation-based approach. And in this case, you basically go through the level you play it and you check how good is it by doing that. So if you are, for example, generating car racing game and you want, to the, and you want, uh, you want a specific characteristic for, for, the, for, the, tra for the track, then you, you train an AI, an AI agent to play through the track and give it a score based on how it turns and how, on, how, on the average speed on, it, on each turn or on each segment. And you talked about that yesterday, right? <laughs> and so on and so forth. Um, if you want to check, for example, for playability, then you have to, to build an AI agent that checks whether a level is, well, can be finished or not. If you are generating content that, um, for example, has to be nice for a specific human player, then you'll have to build an AI, an AI agent that plays as a human, as in Drivatar. Uh, and then that, that agent will give a score based, based on his behavior. Um, the final, the final, sort, uh, final evaluation function that you could use, or the final type of evaluation, evaluation function is, and <laughs> you're making me nervous, is interactive evaluation functions. And in, in, this, in this type of evaluation function, you, uh, you basically have a human who interacts with the system and he gives a score. And in, well, this could be very implicit or explicit, depending on, on the interface. In the Galactic Arm, Armless example, we, we had an indirect evaluation function. And in that case, the, the method indirectly or implicitly know what the player prefer by detecting how fast and how often they choose to, 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 uh, to play each weapon. And for example, if you have, uh, there's another example for, for evolving tracks for, for a car racing game. And in that case, they presented the tracks, so how they look like. To players, they allow them to play to play the tracks, and they they have rank between one and five. So you play tracks one or five times, and then you give it you give it you give it a rank, and that's where you are interactively interacting with the system and giving a score for 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 the tracks. Uh, so we covered more or less search based approach. So we're moving on to constructive approach. From my talk about search-based approaches, you could, you could sense that they are somehow time-consuming because you need to, to have an initial population, you need to rank those, you need to, to go on with, with the evolution process until you reach a feasible solution. Constructive-based approach, on the other hand, um, they are faster because they generate one solution and that's it. But they are, on the other hand, less controllable. So you can't really predict what sort of result you are getting. You have to extensively try and test. So you generate and test until you reach, you reach the content that you are looking for. 
but they are faster because sometimes if you if you do it right then you might get the right answer from from the first steps and i'll give examples about those so agent based approach are are the main main types of constructive approaches they are usually parameterized in a way that you think they should well, these are agents that go through the environment and change it as, as it goes. And they can, can be parameterized based on that. So if you are, for example, building a dungeon, then you can parameterize your agent to go through the environment and dig grooms. And you can do that by placing an, an agent in a 2D grid, uh, giving it parameters about where to place a room. For example, if it has like five by five blocks that are empty, then it can place a room. You can give it direction about when to, to go right or left by, by probability, maybe. So you could somehow change the agent behavior, but you don't really know how the final result will look like until you run the agents a number of times. Agent approaches can also be used to build terrains. And in the example here, we have uh, three different, well, the same agent, but, but with three different parameters. This agent was, um, was told to build pitches. And it has been given different parameters to build wider or narrow pitches as, as it goes through the environment. So it, it, it's, built, it's put in the environment, it detects where the sea is, and it starts digging from there. And depending on the parameter, it, it changes the environment. Another example, a very useful example of, of a constructive based approach is L system. This is a grammar based, more or less, systems. So you write a grammar and and your, the system follows the grammars and explores it as, as it goes. So in, in this case, here we have this um, relatively simple grammar, and you can interpret it as a turtle in a turtle graphics, if you are familiar with, with this. So this basically tells, uh, if, you are, like, if you have a pen and you are drawing things, then it tells the pen to go forward. To, the plus is turning right, for example, by 90 degree. So turn right for 90 degree, and then draw another line turn left to draw another line, so on and so forth. This is very useful if you are representing fractal or thing that happens recursively, uh, such as trees or plants or such uh, similar things. And it has been widely used for, for creating these sort of things. And these are different types of trees that have been created using different grammars. And these grammars can be easily parameterized so that you can backtrack to some areas and you can draw branches, you can detect the, the final ages and you can grow flowers or fruits from there. So th these are pretty useful and, and they give uh, very much nice results. And th the grammars are also can be evolved. So if you have like fitness function for trees that looks very branchy or that looks very tall, so you could evolve grammars that generate trees that looks in a specific way. Uh, a more recent approach that we recently, like th two or three months ago, we published a paper about this, which is called progressive, uh, progressive approach. And this is the combination between constructive and search based approach approaches. So it combines more or less the benefit or the advantages, the advantages of both. And uh, this is distinctive from other approaches because in this case we look we look at games from a different perspective. We separate the the, the game interaction from the content itself. And we look at it into diff two different things. So we first has an, a, an abstract timeline, or what we call an interaction timeline, which is specifies what's actually happening in the game. And this could be translated or interpreted into many different games. So for example here, if you have this, time, this timeline that says after, say, five millise 50, 500 milliseconds, a specific action will happen, and then after a shorter period of time, another action will happen, and then the player should wait for a certain period of time, and then another action will happen, and so on. So if we want to look at this into more specific games, then if you have an example game, uh, do you know Cut the Rope? Who knows Cut the Rope game? OK, some of you don't. So the game looks something like this. Uh, so you have, if you look at the, at the figures down, down, you have a frog there, you have a candy attached to, uh, to ropes. There are some other elements that you can interact with, such as the blower, which I can blow air to change the direction of the movement of the candy. You have the, uh, the rocket, you have some other elements to control where, where the candy can move in the canvas. And the purpose of the game is, to, is for the frog to eat the candy. So in this, in this type of game, you can generate a timeline that, can, that, that tells the game that there should be a rope cut at, at a certain time, certain time. 
this should be followed by another rope cut and so on. So this sort of timeline, timeline can be generated very fast because they, they are easy, they are understandable, and you can, you can easily create those. Another, another type of timeline, the same abstract timeline can also be uh, interpreted into temple run, which gives a totally different, different meaning for the game. So these timelines can then be simulated within the game engine, so, and this is the constructive part. So timelines can be generated using search based approach, but it will be very fast because they are not really evaluated in hard constraints. But then simulation, the, simulating the game will be constructive. So you, you basically scan your timeline and you add component to the game as you go through, through it so that you can make sure that the final output is playable. You could sometime Sometimes you, ha you will have to try a number of times to get a final output that, is, that makes sense, but it, it's usually generate playable output from the first two or three trials. And, the, and this is cool because it, you can get different number of variations for the same timeline. So if you have this, this example here at the bottom, so this timeline has been interpreted as these six different designs. And I think this is cool for game designers because they are more interested into how, how the player interacts with the game. And in this way, they can get variations easily. So, so far we have looked into game content in, in a way that we usually visualize the game. But another factor that we, that we are usually also generating automatically is the game mechanics or the game rules. There are fewer examples of, uh, on this area in, in the research field, but I think it's really interesting. One of the very famous ones is the Ludi system, which, uh, which evolve board games. This, is, this project is, has been there for a while, and it managed to generate the first fully automatically generated board games. The game is now available for you to buy, so it's like you can buy a box with, with this game that has been automatically evolved. And it also relies on search-based approach, and it uh, it uses some sort of uh, it uses its own language language for evolving the content. But it looks something like this. So if if the game is, for example, tic-tac-toe, uh, so it, the grammar says it gives the it gives the name to the game, and that the name is also automatically generated. Uh, it has two players. It's kind of a square grid with a three by three grids. And the game ends when you, when, when you have three, uh, three in a row. And the, the overall framework, is this too much scary? No. <laughs> no. All right, so it, but, but it's very really simple to understand. So you have a population. You start with a population of randomly generated positions in a, or grids for, for a board game. You select, you select patterns that you think are more promising based on criteria that you have previously defined. And then you, you, you run some crossover or mutation. Those are primitive evolutionary operators. And then you basically let agents to play through the game and you calculate ca statistics about how they perform. So if you, if you care, for example, about game balancing, so you check how fast uh, it took for, for one player to win over the other. And if it's very fast, then the game is not so interesting. Uh, so you, you basically define a number of, uh, of measures about, about the interestingness, the balancing, how, how good the game is. And then you evaluate your population based on those. And you evolve until you get a game that matches your preferences. Uh, this is very easy, but uh, according to the author of, of, this, um, of this paper, it's, it took him pretty, pretty much knowledge about the board games. So he, he actually wrote a paper about board games before, write, before writing the, the actual software that evolves board games. So it, it requires quite a lot of understanding about the field to build the, the right evaluation functions. Uh, so uh, the other use of procedural content generation of game is for uh, mixed initiative, what we call mixed mixed initiative BCG, and these are tools that uses BCG in order to support game designers and not purely to build content that is that it's interesting or playable. And I'm going to explain this through an example uh, interface that we built for Kadarop. So we get permission from uh, Zynga to, to use the graphics of the game. We rebuild the whole game using another physical engine. And I like music. All right. 
So this is an interface we have built for this game. You can add component for the game. Right. You can ask the system to check if what you have designed is playable. You can, I'll just stop it here. Oops. Um, all right. Okay. And I'm sorry about that. I just want to pause it. So you can uh, lock some of the components so that the system can keep them in place when generating the the rest of uh, the rest of the level. So those blinking ones are the ones that are blocked, and the, the system automatically creates the rest of the level so that it's playable. You can also project the interactable area, or what's called positive versus negative area, so this, the designer can, automatic, can, can instantly see what part of the canvas he's using when he's generating the level. You can, you can also see the playable path that the candy should follow in order to reach the destination, and these all run on the fly. So this is the timeline that I talked about in, in, uh, previously, and you have the timeline. So, all right. And these are different mappings for the same time that timeline, and you can see how the system gradually generates content as it goes through the timeline. Right. So uh, this is one of the one of the examples of a mixed generative design tools. Uh, I think. Antonius is not here, but he will talk more about CAD systems tomorrow, and they fall in the same area. And I think he will be giving more examples about this. So, um, experience-driven procedural content generation is another way of using BCG systems for different purposes, which is tailoring or adapting content for specific player behavior, so that making the game more engaging, more challenging. In its simplest form, it's challenge, it's a, a dynamic uh, difficulty adjustment, which is usually use, used in commercial games. But we are looking into, into this specific area in, in, a border way, in a border way, so we want to, to generate games that, that, that are tailored in many different ways. So, that, so for example, you can imagine a game that generates content that is less frustrating and more challenging at the same time. And in order to do that, you need a way to detect player behavior. So you need to know how he's feeling while he's playing the game. And you need, you need a way to relate this to the content that you are generating. And finally, you need a content generator to generate the content, taking this information into account. And there are many different ways of measuring how players are feeling, feeling about the game. You can detect their heart rate, skin conductance. You can just use player behavior information detected by Logging by logging information from, from player behavior. You could also use less intrusive method than wiring players, such as camera control or voice recording. So in this case, we recorded uh, facial expression and head gesture from uh, people playing Super Mario Bros. And you can see some distinctive characteristics of when they are losing, when they are feeling challenged, and when they are like happy about the game or winning the game. It also very much depends on the player personality. Some people are more expressive than others. Some of them really don't show any expression at all while playing. And I would say that those are more hardcore gamer than the novice one who like shout and move and stuff. So, uh, so in this part, I'm gonna need. Well, I don't. I'm, I'm not gonna use the facial expression at this time. It's only based on player behavior. But I'm gonna need a volunteer to play the game. No, not this one. I think you played the one for the competition. This is my competition. So, I'm going to just find it. Oh, okay. So, A and A for speed. No, this is the original for my three. That's a good. <laughs> Yeah, feel free. Okay. 
So the game right now know that he's not so good player. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is a randomly generated level, and the game detects his behavior, and then he will ask him about uh, the, the emotion that he wants to, to adjust. Uh, this, is this clear? So, what experience would we like to maximize? It's engagement, frustration, and challenge. <laughs> so. You'll get to use the, uh, yeah, because it's, yeah. it's the original Super Mario Bros. <laughs> so is that maximizing frustration? It's, a, no, it's maximizing frustration, maximizing. yeah. You! <laughs> You just did. So it's somehow detected that he's a friend. <laughs> so more gaps, more enemies, and wider gaps, apparently. Yeah, maybe. All right, let's go. Hey, you got it. That's it. Yeah, it's it's a shorter, shorter levels, yeah, shorter experience. Thank you very much, and <laughs> <Here first. laughs> thank you, Alex. All right. So, uh, so in this case, we used player behavior models extracting extracted from player behavior to predict how the original game was first. How much was was it frustrating or challenging or whatever? And then it explored the content space for a new level in order to to search for the one that is that has a maximum frustrating according to his specific playing style. And it depends on a predefined con content feature that we previously built or choose to, to build a game that is more frustrating or challenging or engaging. So finally, I can hold I'm on time. Uh, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about testing content generator and well, a little bit because we will have a panel by the end of the day and which you, you will get the chance to ask more questions about this specific area. So whenever you build a content generator, you don't, well, we, we write papers about it when we present some primitive kind of samples of the content that we are generating, but we don't really know whether the generator is really good or not because if you, are generating, if you are building a generator, for example, for Super Mario Bros, then you will end up generating thousands of levels, but how much they are different from each other, or how much are you really exploring the space of content that you really want to explore. So in, in this case, for example, for Alex, we generated a level that is frustrating, but if we run it again, will it be the same level, the same exact level, or will it be different, and by how much the difference will be? So these are very much an important question that we need to answer when building content generator. And there is really not quite an answer for that. This is an, a, a relatively new research area. We, we are trying to come up with indications of how to measure expressive range, what we call the expressive range of, of a content generator, or how well he's covering the generator is covering the space of content it is supposed to cover. We usually use numeric values, so we come up with measures of expressivity. We say we want to measure difficulty, so we count the number of enemies, the, the width of the gaps, and so on. We, we weighted them differently according to what we think are more important than others, and we sum them. But if you ask game designers, then they might have very different opinion about that. They might have specific issues that you, they, they want to look at when building content generators. So we are still working in this area. This is a very active area right now. So what, what we usually do is that we come up with a number of different measures and we rank, we, we generate a lot, lots of levels, so let's say 1,000, 5,000, hundreds, or 10,000 or whatever. So a very large number of generators and then we rank them all according to some expressivity measure that we, that we, that we define. And then we visualize the results and we check whether, the, whether that they make sense or not. And that also highlights some limitations of the generator. So these are some examples of uh, five different content generators for Super Mario Bros. Because there have been lots of research done on this, on this specific game. So these are five different generators ranked according to two expressivity measures uh, we called leniency and density. 
So the XY is the leniency measure, which tells how hard it is to, to finish the game. And the density measure tells, it, it goes through the level and it counts for how many items are stacked on, e on top of each other on each specific position. So how many paths basically you can go through to reach the end. And as you can see, each of the generator has, well, these are thousand levels generated by each generator. And there are clearly some distinctive characteristic for each one. They are, they are not really similar to each other, but, they are, but each one of them is also exploring a very wide range of the space that it, it is allowed to explore. And if uh, so some of them, it's, it, well, you, when you look at the graph, you, you think about what happens and that, wh why is that generator specifically good in this area and not in that one. And that, that sometimes highlights limitation in, in the design or fault when you are implementing your method. So for example, in, in our case, we limited, in, in some generators, we limited the maximum range or the minimum range of, of, the, of the widths of the gaps. And that ended up generating more easier level than, than others generator. And you can simply detect this sort of thing, simple thing that you usually do into the generator without, into, without like knowing that this might have a, a great impact uh, on, on the output. So, yeah. I'll talk more about that later today, but thank you for now. Thanks.